Well, it's a clip joint and everybody knows it. Them townies still keep coming out, just itching to drop silver. Why? You step through that gate. by the beast. Hey, kid. Anything can happen. I was always fascinated with the carnivals. And um, I think it's a universal experience that we just don't see dramatized. We very rarely see the other side of the stage. The premise of our show takes the idea that down through time and memorial, there's been a long struggle of good versus evil in a classic sense. And that to each generation of man was born a creature of light and a creature of darkness. What we're doing is we're taking an almost biblical template and using it as an overlay for this difficult, terrible, desperate time in American history. Drought and pestilence fester in the very heart of this great land. Titanic sandstorms, the likes of which man has not seen since the days of the prophets. And I ask myself, what are these things? Carnival takes place in 1934, during the heart of the Depression. People were out on bread lines, and unemployment was running somewhere in the 20% range. Internationally, this is the rise of fascism overseas. Uh, Hitler and Mussolini are now on the map. The seeds of the Second World War are there, but people are really not paying attention to what's going on. It was a massive social and political upheaval. At the same time that all of this is happening, and people are losing their savings, and people are losing their farms, and people are losing their homes. In the middle of the country, you have this sort of act of God, this dust bowl situation, which creates even more immiseration and more pain and more insanity. You hit the topsoil from four states blown into the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, there were ocean liners where they would get up in the morning and there'd be dust from Kansas on the rails. They just engulfed towns. They turned night into day. People were dying of dust pneumonia. <laughs> I mean, they were hacking up mud. We always say, well, it's because we you know, overplowed or there's some sort of sociological, scientific, whatever reason there is for it. But the real reason in this story is because the devil was here. The conceit of the show is that to every generation is born a creature of good and a creature of evil. It's really built on two parallel storylines, the group of carnies traveling during the Depression and the impact on them of this man, Ben Hawkins, who they pick up along the road. He's basically a kid who has um, a gift, and he's, it's kind of been repressed. Get out. <coughs> Get your hands off me. Filth. He's had these powers since he was a kid, but He's been taught to be ashamed of them to a degree. His mother's passed away and he's trying to bury her. And here comes the carnival. Kid, I'm about to make you the offer of a lifetime. Hey, stop calling me kid, OK? My name is Ben Hawkins. Well, Ben Hawkins, how would you like a career in show business? This whole thing is about self-realization and becoming aware of these powers and, and learning to harness them and learning the implications of this battle between good and evil. You got the gift, just like you. The other story is a preacher in California. Brother Justin is a small town Methodist minister who's basically tending his flock when he begins to have some very troubling visions. He is a trained and talented preacher, a man of God. And that's, that's the path that he's chosen. That's the calling he believes that he's hearing. He spoke to me, Iris. And I shall carry out his will. Praise the Lord. His sister is also aware of this. And she's pushing him to achieve his greatness. Iris has been aware since she was a little girl that her brother had these powers but she believes he is here for a, a real reason. Now, pray with me, sister. Pray, pray. <laughs> Kneel and pray! I love my brother more than anybody or anything in the world, and I would do anything for him. With Ben beginning to use his powers and Justin beginning to be visited by these, these dreams, things are beginning to reach some sort of critical mass. 
I am the tarot card reader in the carnival. My mother is a queen of the gypsies. She is catatonic and we communicate telepathically and she basically is the one with the powers and I channel that. What are you doing here? Just having a chat. Well, get the hell out! You leave me no choice, my dear. Mama, are you all right? That's it! I've had enough of your tantrums! Well, Professor Lodes is a man of many lives. He is the uh, blind mentalist. Whenever Lodes approaches a situation or a person, he can see pretty much what the future of that situation is. He's dangerous, Samson. Oh, hell. He's a rube. Samson is surrounded by characters of extraordinary perceptions and ability. Ladies and gentlemen, witness amazing human oddities. The Siamese sisters, the amazing reptilian. And boys, hold on to your eyeballs inside this tent and get a load of the cooch. Coochie Coochie Dancer is a, what at that time would be like a stripper. Sure, but, stripper. But it's really, we do a lot of posing. At that time, I don't think that a lot of husbands even saw what their wives looked like naked. But during the Depression, I think it's a good way to make a living. A lot of people that, uh, if it not for the carnival, they may have found no place in this world at all. Hey, watch it. Freaks were uh, sort of the celebrities of the time and it had more money than most people during the Depression because people paid to come and see them. I'm not a freak. No, I'm, I'm just a beautiful woman with a hormone problem. <laughs> She's got pubic hairs on her chin. That's the problem. Everybody has a really good attraction in this show, but I think we're the main one. <laughs> Carnival consists of all these freaky sideshow characters, and we're just trying to get by during the Depression. Don't y'all have a regular, you know, like... Circuit? Yeah. Used to. Now it's just town by town. Since when? Since you showed up. The series has a certain elliptical way of storytelling. We don't really explain everything that happens right away. You may not understand everything that's going on, but everything does make a certain sense. And you're never gonna feel cheated. Take it away. So, you saw the man last night? I didn't see him. I talked to him, though. What did he say? He told me how I can help someone. I don't know what you gotta do. I don't rightly care. But I do know what kind of games management plays, and he don't care much for people. Cut. Excellent. I think I can say without fear of contradiction, this may be the largest and most complicated show in television. The scale of this show is larger than many of the features I've worked on. Just the carnival alone takes four or five days just to strike and to move and to reset up. These are all the drawings that we have produced for the show. We have drawers full of them. We're averaging about 10 new sets and episodes. Every episode, there's a new town that they're visiting, and there's a new gas station, and a new cafe, and a new everything, you know? So it just seems to go on and on and on. <laughs> We're in the set for one of our main characters, whose brother Justin. Anything with the 30s is still getting harder and harder to find. We find some of our things from researching old Sears and Robux catalogs. $49.85 for the sofa and chair. The production design is absolutely key. Um, Dan Bishop is doing an amazing job at building these sets and creating the look. He and I talk about color palette, tone, how dirty things should be. Dirt's a big part of this set. You know, it's a really stark period. You know, you don't really see that in America very often in any historical context. You know, we really tried to convey that through the clothing as much as possible. Everybody's filthy and ragged. I mean, here's the kind of really beautiful gowns, and there's a lot of these. And once you add about four pounds of dirt and shred it up a little bit more, it's ready for camera on this show. There's a lot of glamour. Some days we'll have 150 extras, all of which have to be made up, you know, haircuts, period, wardrobe, period. We calculated that we will probably, by the end of the season, 
have costumed close to 5,000 people. Let's move the pump over this way. The initial challenge, apart from the ambition physically of reproducing a period carnival that travels from place to place, it was weaving into it the supernatural elements of the story. It has a lot of magic. It was always, you know, our impression that it would be much better to integrate the magic very naturally. We're doing a wide range of visual effects. We're doing everything from natural effects such as rain and snow and computer-generated plants to a CG fetus to a ton of matte paintings and changing backgrounds. The whole thing is shot in, uh, in the Los Angeles area. And we had California mountains in our background. Uh, we had the task of actually modifying the environment and digitally removing mountains. Throughout the series, we're constantly blowing smoke and dust through the scenes. We used tubes to give a constant sense of dry, dusty environment. When the big storm hits, we were able to create a dust cloud that covered about 30 to 50 feet across on the stage. But using our background photography, we were able to line up the perspectives and the cameras. So we are able to mix those two very carefully and actually create the impression of a dust storm that's hundreds and hundreds of feet high and, and miles across. The kind of magic that we're going to see on this show is so subtle, it's the kind of magic that you're going to go, did that happen? Is that a trick? And that's the game we're going to play. It's a carnival. Things are never what they seem. You want to tell me what's going on here? Things are changing. Not for the better. There's certainly nothing like it on television. I don't know that there ever has been. Remember what you've done here. Remember what you did before your faces were on billboards, on bus stops, and People Magazine, and The Inquirer. <laughs> be proud of it. I think people will be very engaged by it, but it's something they're going to have to watch, and maybe watch twice. Now, the people in these towns, they're asleep. We wake them.